are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is American Free Press reporter Pete Papa Heracles. Pete, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? I'm good, Pete. You know, the last time we spoke, I think, on an interview such as this was when one of your articles had really taken off, and that was an article you wrote about the Rothschilds wanting Iran's banks. This article was put up online on February 10th, 2012. So you're talking almost two years ago. It'll be two years before we know it. And that has been the number one article as far as statistics go on the American Free Press website for a while. It took off several times by being linked in various websites. And it's still now, not recently, like the numbers it had in the past, but it still is picked up. It's a very popular article. And like I said, on AmericanFreePress.net, it's the number one article as far as the most viewed. Now, an article you wrote that was published online in this year, July 24th, 2013, The Real Mandela, about Nelson Mandela, who, of course, just passed on the other day, has taken off like wildfire. And, of course, the term that's used on the Internet is viral. Well, this has gone viral in a sense that it was picked up by Google somehow. There is some combination of words that were put in Google, the search engine, that attracted a lot of readers to this article, which, again, was published in July. So when it came out in July, it didn't really get that much attention. Of course, Mandela was still alive. He was hospitalized. And after his passing, I imagine there were a lot of people doing some kind of a search. You thought it might have been Mandela kill whites or something like that. Is that right, yes. Pete? And when someone puts that word combination into Google, what happens is it brings up the American Free Press article right on the first page. So consequently, people from all over the world have been pouring into American Free Press because of this article. Now, the purpose of this interview is to discuss this article. And I just want to say that, as I've mentioned many, many times before, I don't watch television, but I had the opportunity over the past two days to be in front of a television, not my television, with folks, and they had it on. And I watched briefly, and it seemed like any channel you went to, there was this almost, I'm looking for the word, but it's, it's almost like the media, the mainstream media, is trying to, I shouldn't say trying, they are, they're painting Mandela as some kind of a saint. And even in my email box, I got a Wall Street Journal special offer, which I don't think the Wall Street Journal has ever done this before. Wall Street Journal is giving away for nothing a Nelson Mandela ebook. Wow. Completely for free. Nelson Mandela making peace. The Wall Street Journal presents the inspiring story about one of the world's most legendary leaders, Nelson Mandela. Derived from original reporting, this ebook pays tribute to his extraordinary life from prisoner to president of a democratic South Africa and finally to revered elder statesman. Follow Mandela's iconic journey and download this ebook today. A special offer from the Wall Street Journal. Download now. <laughs> Now, besides the fact that I've never seen the journal give anything away for free like this, and on top of the fact that I saw how the mainstream media is treating this particular fellow's passing, and juxtaposed with what I know about Mandela because of your article, why don't we go through Nelson Mandela the way that you researched him, not the fluff and the emotion and the nonsense that we're hearing now spewed all over the mainstream media. This article, The Real Mandela, which was published online July 24th, 2013, and has now, and it still is, it's taking off. People are tapping into it. Why do you think there's so many people, besides the fact that Google brought them there, that still doesn't guarantee that they're going to read it and it's just going to keep growing and growing. Why do you think that so many people are really fascinated by this article? Well, it's probably one of the few articles that portrays a different picture than what the mainstream trance has been on here to, to you know, the myth of Mandela that they've been selling. So I'm sure some people have an idea that the way that they're spinning Mandela's life is inaccurate. So when they see an alternative point of view, maybe they gravitate towards it because they want to know what perhaps they already suspect or that they partially know to be true. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the evolution of the words on that article. It said from, what did it say, from revolutionary to, or from prisoner to president to elder statesman. I would have phrased it differently, from Marxist murdering terrorist 
to convict in life in prison to coming out and destroying his country. <laughs> Maybe I'd use different words, but, you know, his life has been, you know, completely different than they've portrayed it. I mean, they, they portrayed him as some kind of Gandhi-esque personality, and this guy's responsible for killing over 100,000 people, really. Whites? Whites and blacks. Lately, more whites, because, you know, since the ANC took over in 1994, Mandela has been the top cheerleader for uh, basically just killing whites, especially the Boers, just whites in general. The Boers, especially because they take their land, they take their farms, they confiscate everything, they have more to take, but just whites in general. But before that, it was killing blacks because it was just intimidating and terrorizing the blacks of South Africa to join the African National Congress. And if they didn't, they would get well, killed. They would get necklaced. And what is that? Necklacing was one of the favorite methods of killing people, which was to put a tire around their neck, fill the tire with gasoline and put the tire around their neck and then set it ablaze. And uh, these people would just die the most horrific uh, death like that. And isn't Mandela's wife serving prison or something like that for necklacing? Oh, no, no. They get awards for that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, she was actually one of the top uh, cheerleaders. Well, not cheerleaders, but advocate for this uh, method. I think I had a quote for her of exactly the words that she used. She said something like with our matchsticks and our cans of gasoline, we're going to take over South Africa. We're going to liberate South Africa, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. with our boxes of matches and our necklaces, we shall liberate this country, mm. she was infamous for saying. Well, there was an estimated 3,000 victims that died by necklacing, and she was like the leader of the necklacing gang, if you will. So Brutal. I guess it's the way that they put uh, Al Capone in jail for tax evasion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> Let's get to Winnie's husband. Nelson, let's get to your article here, because it starts off as South Africa's 95-year-old Nelson Mandela lies in the hospital. The worldwide media portrays him as a larger-than-life heroic figure and the liberator of his people. But is that truth or fiction? And how will honest historians judge him? You go on to explain when he was born in 1918, the tribe, and where he studied and he joined, of course, this African National Congress. It's kind of a, uh, a little background for the listeners. What exactly is the African National Congress? Well, the African National Congress it was a group that he founded in 1961, along with uh, Joe Slovo, I believe. You know, it was right around the same time that we had the civil rights movement happening in this country. And just like the civil rights movement that we had, it was backed up by Soviet communists. It was a communist plan to basically subvert the Western white cultures, both in South Africa and here. The difference with South Africa, of course, is that you had a lot more blacks than you had here. But both of them were backed by the Soviet Union. Martin Luther King was a communist in the same way that uh, Mandela was a communist. And uh, Martin Luther King was uh, handled by uh, Stanley Levison, and Mandela's handler was uh, Joe Salvo, who was both of these gentlemen were Jewish, and they were also the presidents of uh, the Communist Party in their respective countries. So, in essence, the African National Congress was the equivalent to the civil rights movement here, but a radical terrorist organization, not, you know, that would basically go around and set bombs at different places and blow things up and kill a lot of people. Very nice. Uh, As a matter of fact, when uh, he was finally caught, they had this farm. Again, there was a heavy Jewish influence here. They arrested 19 people in 1962, I believe. And uh, half of them were Jewish. And one of them owned this big farm. And they had sort of like a cover operation to where they made it like they were doing farming there. When in essence, they were building explosives and ammunition and all that. The uh, prosecutor said at the trial that they had enough ammunition to blow up a city the size of Johannesburg. They were indicted for 221 cases, I think, of terrorism. Mandela pleaded guilty to 156 of them, you know, including bombing railway stations and bombing uh, arcades and bars and courthouses and all types of things like that. Okay. Why do you think it is that, and this is not directly related to Mandela, but why do you think it is that throughout history, Jews are so heavily represented in revolutionary type affairs where they're bombing people and killing people? And why do you think that is? Well, it's the basic communism format. 
it's portrayed as a revolution of the downtrodden, of the oppressed, of the proletariat, if you will, you know, under communism. You know, the formula is to get the uh, certain segment of the lower class of the population to believe that the reason that they're poor or that they don't have enough is because the middle class is exploiting them. And then you turn them into a revolutionary mob. And in the meantime, by having them do terrorist acts like that, it puts fear into the parts of the middle class and forces them to give up some of their power, in which case, well, ultimately the bankers or the corporations or the Jews or the special interests take that power away for themselves and eventually end up taking over the power institutions of a particular country. So the blacks were used in South Africa in the same way that they were used here. And they put a chip on their shoulder that, you know, only reason that they didn't excel in the degree that whites did was because they had been exploited and they were prejudiced against and racism and uh, that type of thing. And of course, it was uh, you know, the white man's fault. And of course, they believed it because it's convenient to believe that. And whites were brainwashed with, you know, ideas of equality and white guilt and what have you. And, you know, some of them, you know, the more liberal types believed it. That's a way of taking down the establishment, the structure of a particular country. OK, but why do you think it is that it's so heavily represented by Jews? Well, it's their world domination policy that they have had what we call the New World Order. You know, they've had a plan from antiquity, according to, you know, their own records and what have you, to take over the world because they feel like it belongs to them, like it was promised to them by, I don't know, Jehovah or somebody, you know. They've been working on the plan that it's their destiny to rule the world. And uh, this has proven to be one of the key ways of doing it and starting revolutions in the name of equality and liberating the oppressed. They shake things up and take the power. Let's just talk about this guy, Joe Slovo, who was born Yasel Marshall Slovo. <laughs> something like that. Lithuanian-born communist Jew, and I'm getting this from your article here. I just recently wrote a new article today, actually. I sent it in, and it'll be go in this week's American Free Press, which is an updated version now that, you know, Mandela... Uh, is dead. You know, in researching it, you know, I found more information about some of these things. And it's widely believed that Mandela actually ordered all those killings from prison. As a matter of fact, one of the items that I put in the new article was that in 1985, now he had finally gotten sentenced, I think, in 64. The trial started in 62. He was in prison in 1964, and he was supposed to get the death penalty. But some string pulling, I guess, occurred, and he got life in prison. Well, by 1985, 21 years after he was in prison, the president of South Africa, W. something Botha was his name, if you recall. I do. He, yeah, he offered Mandela freedom. He offered to release him under one condition. I guess they knew that he was the one that was very influential and he was the leader of the African National Congress who were the ones doing all this killing, about 20,000 people, as I said, while he was in prison. So Botha offered to release him under the condition that he would denounce violence and help end the bloodshed. And Mandela refused. He oh. refused. I mean, what does that tell you? You know, he would not stop doing this. He's not Gandhi. He's definitely not Gandhi. Right. But he's sure portrayed as Gandhi, and everybody believes that he's Gandhi, and they gave him the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> they also gave yeah. Obama the Nobel Peace Prize even before he <laughs> was president. What a complete joke it is, isn't it? But now, this is the question here. Obviously, there's a full court press here by the mainstream media to convince the poor bastards who actually watch television and believe it that Mandela has reached sainthood. Why do you think it is that it's so important for the mainstream media to convince people that Mandela is a saint? Look, it's the same reason that the media is telling us that Trayvon Martin was a poor little black child, innocent little Skittles and iced tea drinking child that was just hopping along from the 7-Eleven and got killed by the racist Zimmerman. To portray blacks as victims and portray whites as villains. That's basically what it's doing. Because, look, the legacy here 
the alleged legacy of Mandela is that, well, you know, he might have had to kill a few people here and there, although they downplay that, but it was justified because he was a freedom fighter. He liberated his country from apartheid rule. And, you know, apartheid is used as a dirty word. You know, apartheid meant, of course, segregation, right? That's supposed to be a sin. You know, you're not supposed to live separately because that means that, you know, white people are racist and don't want blacks around because, you know, they're just hateful. And this is a victory because he liberated his people from a white oppression. So that's the same role that, you know, your Al Sharptons and your Jesse Jacksons and all these other race pimps play here, that the blacks have been brutally oppressed by whites and now they're liberating themselves. That's the same idea that they've sort of brainwashed the whole world with. So there is some kind of like a central agenda by the mainstream media. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And it's really an attack on the white race, on the white males, especially that, you know, the world was really terrible when whites were ruling. And now, you know, it's time for the blacks to have their equal position, if you will, and take over. But the fact of the matter is they don't talk about what's actually happened to South Africa since Mandela took over. They totally neglect mentioning that. What's happened? Well, except the fact that he ordered and instigated the white genocide, which is still taking place today, and killed about 70,000 white people just for being white. And because, well, now that the blacks took over, it was payback time. Other than that, the country itself has become a third world country. It used to be a first world country, used to be the richest, the most prosperous and the safest country. When the whites were running it. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, the whites built that whole civilization from the beginning. You know, people are not very aware of history. They think blacks were living there nicely and comfortably and whites went over there and wiped them out and took over. That wasn't the case. The South Africa was almost completely depopulated. All the blacks lived further up north. You know, relatively speaking, South Africa is a colder place because it's further away from the equator and what have you. And uh, the people that went there and uh, colonized it were the Dutch of the Boers, the farmers, that they themselves were some type of Protestants, I believe, that were persecuted, you know, by Catholics and that kind of thing, or by the British. I'm not sure who they were persecuted from, but they went there to get away from persecution themselves. They weren't colonialists, per se. So they went there, and I don't know the full story of how they built the country, but the point is the Zulus, I think they're the main tribe, they were basically further up north in Rhodesia, and it was only after the whites built cities and civilizations or what have you that the blacks came down because, you know, there were jobs, there was food, there was civilization, clothing, medical, education, civilization. But being who they were, they created problems for the whites. So the whites tolerated them, but said, okay, fine. I mean, you know, we'll build separate facilities for you and you can, you know, use the colored bathroom, let's say, and we'll use the white bathroom, you know. And they'll show pictures of that as proof of how terrible apartheid was. But they don't mention the point that they didn't have a bathroom of their own. Here, the whites built them a bathroom or a restaurant or a water fountain or all these things. They didn't have any of these things before. They they came there for these things, you know. Where did they go to the bathroom? I don't know, in the woods. I mean, they came from the jungle. These guys, they never had civilization. They never got out of the Stone Age before the white people went there. You know, this idea that these guys had these great civilizations and all this stuff, I mean, that's total myth. There's absolutely no proof of it. None. I mean, they never got out of the Stone Age. They never invented the wheel. They never built anything but mud huts. They didn't have clothes. They didn't have shoes. Right. And they're still in the Stone Age as we speak. Well, the, well, you know, in all these countries, I mean, you can say whatever you want about colonialism in a lot of these countries and, you know, how blacks were exploited and what have you. But the point is, they just didn't have civilization before at all. In sub-Saharan Africa, civilization didn't exist. The term was just non-existent. Never had a written language, never had clothing, never had anything. So these guys, they came in after the whites, and then the whites said, fine, okay, we'll let you be here. Maybe they were cheap labor, maybe not. Uh, I don't know the details, but the point is, that was the sin, apparently, that they are supposedly paying for now, and that's why Mandela went around and started genociding the whites. And it's a policy that's still going on today, by the way, because the current president, you can go on YouTube, Jacob Zuma is his name, there's a little YouTube video from last year, from 1912, and he's on there in a the big stadium and he's actually on the podium with a microphone singing the song
on, kill the white man. With our machine guns, we're going to kill him. With our machine guns, he's going to run, kill the boer, kill the white man. And you see all the blacks dancing and holding up the AK-47s. So the actual president of the country is enticing the blacks to genocide the whites. And then they kill them. And the Boers, especially, because traditionally had the, you know large farms, they'll just kill them and just take their farms, take everything. And they don't just kill them the way they kill them. I've seen. Oh, yeah. My God. It's so brutal. Yeah. It's too brutal to even mention in this show, you know. I know. Yeah, it's disgusting. And of course, when you do talk about this stuff, the politically correct out there will condemn you for being a racist because you want to bring up these facts of how horrendous these characters are. And of course, we're not talking about all black. So before anybody you know, gets their panties in a wad about what we're saying, no, we're not talking about all blacks. We're just talking about the blacks who do this. Yes, there are blacks who are nice. OK, are you happy? We said it. But, you know, the nice blacks, though, Dave, got necklaced by Mandela's people. Yeah. If they didn't want to join his terror organization, then they were just killed and made an example of. So eventually a much larger percentage of them joined him because he would kill them if they didn't. This guy was definitely no Gandhi. Now, Pete, you mentioned before about your other article. Anything else you want to touch upon? That yeah, you... yeah. I, I just wanted to finish what I was saying. Oh, yeah, except, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Except the white genocide that uh, we mentioned, right? How South Africa has degenerated into a third world country. Well, first of all, when Mandela took over, unemployment was at 5%. Now it's at 50%. South Africa was the safest country in South Africa. Now it's the rape and murder capital of the world. In Johannesburg, 5,000 people are murdered every year. Every year, 5,000 people are murdered. Not just whites, primarily blacks, really, because the whites, I think they're like 9 or 10% of the population. The country has about 45 million people, so you get about 4, 4.5 million whites. You know, it's just like here. I mean, blacks primarily kill their own, but they also kill a lot of white people. You know, they tend to be more violent, as you know, as all the statistics yeah. prove. Oh, yeah, it's very clear. And here, of course, you know, they've had several generations, a couple of hundred years of sort of living with whites and becoming more accustomed to our culture. You know, down there, you know, it hasn't been that long because a lot of them have just come a generation or two away from the jungle. 18% of adults have AIDS in South Africa. Wow. 5,700,000 people have AIDS. That was six, it, seven years ago. Yeah. And in 2010, an estimated 280,000 of them died of AIDS. In researching the article, I was looking at some statistics, too many to put, you know, in the article. But one of them is saying 40 percent of all schools don't have electricity now. They used to back when he took over. So the whole system is just basically just going to pot. Maintenance isn't being kept up. The economy is not being run properly. And it's just degenerating into just a crime like living on Detroit, but even worse. Okay, so it's a disaster now. So let's get to your new article. Did you want to say anything else about that? Some new things I put on here. Well, one thing that I don't know whether people are aware of is that the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela were declared a terrorist organization by Ronald Reagan. They were on the terror watch list and forbidden entrance to the United States. That didn't get repealed until 20 years later under George W. Bush in 2008. So up to 2008, they were considered a terrorist organization like Al-Qaeda. Right. Yet Mandela has gotten the Price. Nobel Peace Prize and about 250 more awards, medals from everyone. You know, even the Queen gave him a medal. All these heads of states give him medals. Presidential Medal of Freedom or something we gave him. Why do you think it is that Reagan did that and then that buffoon, George W. Buffoon, did that? Well, obviously there were pressures promoting the illusion that South Africa was really doing great and they're making such progress or something. But I'll tell you what, I was looking at Dick Cheney. You know, we always bash Dick Cheney for reasons that he deserves, of course. But under Ronald Reagan at the time, he was one of the people that voted to have the ANC declared a terrorist organization. And he was uh, recently, yesterday or something, interviewed, and he says, I don't regret that one bit. They were a terrorist organization. And Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. Mm. So uh, I don't know how much action that's getting in the mainstream news. Probably yeah. not. But... Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, it's incredible how they all move in lockstep. They should be ashamed of themselves, the way they're falling all over each other to convince the poor, dumb Americans who don't have a way to think on their own that this guy is special. It's incredible. All people have to do is open up their eyes and they could see that there's something afoot here. 
one of the uh, many places that he bombed was a place called the Kodeberg Nuclear Power Plant. He okay. actually set bombs off on a nuclear power plant. I mean, what kind of sentence should somebody get for that? At the rugby stadium, put a bomb in a stadium, blow up the stadium. Three courthouses, bars, all kinds of other places. A nuclear power plant. The guy went and bombed a nuclear power plant, and he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. You know that the world that we live in, it's almost like an opposite world. It almost is exactly like an opposite world, where these people will get awards for killing people. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say. It's just shocking, except I want to congratulate you on the article. This is a big, big movement in the numbers here for an article. Right now, and of course this changed from since we've been talking, right now this is number one as far as the unique page views. So it is number one in unique page views, and it's about to be number one in page views, which are, of course, individuals who might have gone back to the article more than once. Wow. So here, this is the number one article here in unique page views. So congratulations, Pete. There's a Thank new you, there's a new article that's sitting on top of the heap here, and that is The Real Mandela by Pete Papa Heraclis. Pete, thanks for educating the listeners about this fellow Mandela. It's important that as many people as possible learn the real facts. Just hold your breath or whatever you got to do. Right? Listen to the truth and try to find out what the mainstream media is hiding from you. And I just want to mention that before we sign off, Pete, that really because of this article, activity that it precipitated on the website, it's brought so many more people, thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of new people to American Free Press that right now there's there's a promotion going on at wow. American Free Press. Yeah, and it's never been done before, anything like this. And this is a Christmas gift. If you go to the website, AmericanFreePress.net, you'll see it says, we're in the Christmas spirit. American Free Press is giving away a free one-year AFP online subscription. No purchase necessary till December 31st. Wow. Yeah, so it says here, Merry Christmas from all of us to all of you. Christmas is a time of giving, and in that wonderful spirit, American Free Press would like to give you a gift for making us one of the Internet's top alternative news websites. From all of us at American Free Press to all of you who keep us going, Merry Christmas. Wow, I should get the word out. How long? A one-year subscription? This is a one-year wow. online subscription, absolutely free. No strings attached, no, no purchase necessary. That's absolutely right. No strings oh, wow. attached, no purchase necessary, just for stopping by. Really kicked off by the absolute success of this article. You know, it lifted the website, American Free Press, to a new level here because of this. Yeah. And if we could in any way thank people for coming and checking out the website, that's what we thought. So um, stop by, bring your friends, bring your enemies, bring whoever you want to bring. Get a free one-year online subscription to American Free Press. Like Pete said, no strings attached, no purchase necessary. And if you're already a subscriber to American Free Press and you have the online edition, not a problem. Just add another year onto your current subscription for free. Wow. Yeah. So you don't have to renew. You got a free subscription there. Again, Pete, thanks for taking the time out today to talk about this. And thanks for writing that article. You're very welcome. I mean, it's, uh, it's my honor to, uh, to have caused this much traffic there to come into our website. So I'm pleased. I'm glad you told me that. That's great, man. I appreciate it. You taking the time out to come on. Looking forward to reading your next article and talking to you in the future. Okay. Thank you.